Welcome to Sacred Justice, a podcast that features discourse rooted in the pursuit of justice as sacred practice. Our weekly discussions reflect on current events, art, media, theology, and how they intersect with the movements for freedom and liberation. We hope that through these conversations, we can foster inclusivity by expanding our learning opportunities. We hope to cultivate digital community beyond the confines of our campus. And we hope to reconnect the church's social and spiritual callings. Join us for the journey. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Sacred Justice. This is the final episode of our Sacred Adventure series, walking us through the season of Advent and now on to Christmas. Mm -hmm. Um, I am Mia McLean, and I am here with... Ben Boswell. For the last time. This is my last podcast (laughs) for all of human history. (laughs) History is over, basically, (laughs) so this is it. But it, but here's the thing, though, Mia. Whenever you, folks miss me over the sabbatical, they can just go back online and pull up a previous episode and listen to my voice. The soothing nature of it makes you fall asleep. It makes you feel at home. You know, it's so comforting. A lot of people say that it's very positive. You know, it's very positive and joyful. <laughs> There's a lot of joy yeah, there. Peace on joy. Lots of joy on Sunday. So much joy. <laughs> Um, we will miss you on the podcast, Ben. Um, but um, lying through my teeth, I'm happy for you going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your jealousy is clear right uh, now about this. Look, if you tr- don't try to replace me on this podcast with someone because it's not going to work. I'm irreplaceable. Uh, you will not replace us. You and it, Bob- it, I won't. <laughs> DJ Hairless is irreplaceable. But I will oh have God. you could just get some other bald white guy in here to do the same thing I'm doing. My God. I'll just, have some Greg questions. could do what I'm doing and he has more hair. Just bring Greg on. You're right. You're right. This is a good idea. Yeah. Um I have some special guests coming up um soon, some church members who have been wanting to, you know, go go on about some topics that are passionate, they're passionate about. Good. That's um, good. We need that. So we'll be still we'll be still chatting with you all. I hope you all still listen to the many things we have planned to come up while Ben's away for three months, enjoying mm-hmm. his time. Mm-hmm. I'll send, uh, you won't see me on you won't find me on Facebook, but you might find me on Instagram. That's where the, you won't find me. You won't okay. find me on Facebook. Yes, you shouldn't. You should just delete Facebook. <laughs> I might delete it permanently. Of course, Instagram's connected there, so oh, I have to true. delete them both. That's true. Um, well, welcome back, y'all, to our podcast. Last week, we talked a little bit about grief and loss mm-hmm. at this time, and we know that that's a continual journey. So continue to take care of yourselves during yes. this holiday season. I know that it can be difficult. and There's so much commercialism and things that just don't quite line up with what the gospel is telling us and who the gospel is calling us to be at this time. But mm. Let's get into some joy. We have some joyful things to talk about. But first, we're going to talk about the bad things first, get rid of those things, and then the joy. Yeah, get out of the way. So current events, Ben, what is your current event this week that's pressing, that's just kind of causing you to pause and think about what justice is? Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking a lot about the folks who are facing all the devastation uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee, sort of a 25-mile period you know, um, stretch of just utter devastation, uh, in our Midwest area. And I was thinking a lot about, um, the story of the, the workers who were trapped at Amazon at the Amazon factory during that. And it reminded me, you know, this is a natural disaster, but it reminded me of, of the, the garment industry in New York and folks getting trapped in a fire in the garment industry in New York. Uh, and, the horror of people having to jump out of buildings and things like that to try to survive and, and, and the light that that raised on working conditions. And, and so part of my hope here is that in the midst of this tragedy, out of this tragedy um, could come just an incredible um, 
an awareness of the the plight of Amazon workers in these in these Amazon plants all over the country now, and how awful it is. I, I can tell you firsthand, well, secondhand from my own family members who've worked in Amazon plants and some really close friends of mine uh, who work there and no longer can. Uh, it is brutal. We've had we've got church members there. Um, it's looking more and more like that's the future of work for those who um, really just can't get jobs anywhere else. And it's, it's really brutal. And there's that movie nomad, I think it won the Academy award. That's about people basically migrating for jobs, job refugees, job migration. Um, and, you know, I think there's going to be more and more of that in our economy and our economic system. And I hope that those who are uh, more gainfully employed and secure in their employment will, um, will turn their eyes and, and read and educate themselves about the precarity of the economic uh, and employment situation of most Americans. And, you know, it's interesting that we get lost in all this in the midst of the great resignation, mm. which, which is a resistance movement. It's not just a reaction. It's a resistance movement to low wages. Yeah. And, and we really need to wrestle with, um, you know, this, there's this sort of, I don't know what you would call it, a con maybe a conservative idea that, oh, well, people should just take whatever job they can get. Yeah. And and that this goes back to things you and I have talked about. That negates the humanity of the people who we're talking about. Because if we talk about their humanity, we've joked about this before. You, you, you can't get on a bus you know, and spend three hours on a bus to get to your job, work for a couple hours, get back on that bus and drive back and take care of any children. Mm -mm. You know, let alone, is it even worth it? Is it worth it to drive on a bus for $10 an hour wages at a restaurant, you know, that may or may not have a good day or a bad day, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so people are making decisions. They're saying, no, it's actually easier for me. You know, this is a better choice for me not to do this. I'll provide childcare for my family or I'll, and, and that's the thing. The other, the other thing people are not talking about is who's leaving the workplace, right? Yeah. The statistics on women leaving the workplace, making that calculation that it is easier are so much higher. Um, and, and so we, yeah, I think this is a time for us to sit, you know, especially around the holiday season is to really think about what does it mean, you know, to care, to be people who care for the poor yeah. um, and how do we edu educate ourselves in a way where we can be empathetic to the situation and not judgmental of the poor yeah. uh, and not just the poor, poor, but the working poor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was reading some articles about how Amazon has these rules. Allegedly, I don't want to get sued. Um, Amazon has these rules about how you can't take your phones into your area of work. So there was no way for people to know that a tornado was coming because they didn't have their phones and your phones usually go off if there's a, to a tornado warning nearby. But if you're not allowed to carry your phone, how are you? So they couldn't even, you know, save themselves, many of them. And, and, and so it's just, it, it's, it highlights a lot of the intersecting injustices that we talk about on this podcast and mm. uh, very sad. Um, a lot of churches destroyed. Yeah. I saw that. I saw a couple, yeah. So a couple of those and um, people's homes at this time of year, it's getting mm. colder outside, you know, it's just, it's, it's really devastating. So um, we, we are, praying with and for those people. And also yeah. there's ways to send money directly to them. Okay. You can go online and find there's a few churches. There's a PCUSA church. And if you go to the PCUSA website, you probably can find what that church is doing in their own area. And that church was pretty much leveled. Um, yeah. But they're raising direct, like direct cash uh, money right now. So you can send them, I think Venmo and cash app and all sorts of things that are quick and easy there's also an AME church, I think it's St. James, that also, um, I think they had a fire connected to the tornado. And so I think they are also raising funds. So if you can get that money directly to these people, that's the best way to go. Mia, explain what you mean by directly. Like, I think some of our listeners might want to know, what is the definition of mutual aid? What does it mean? Well, okay, so here's the So mutual aid is an ongoing fund yeah. that people pour into. Then there's emergency aid. And what I mean by directly is don't send your money to the church. Don't send your money to Myers Park Baptist Church. And then we have to send your, our, the money to somebody else. I mean, we, we will, if we have to, send our money to somebody else, right? But there are churches who are saying, 
give to us right now. We don't have time for it to go to your church and then your church has to process it, go through the, the finance manager and then the finance manager has to cut the check. And then by the time all that's done, January. Mm. No, no, no. If these people are needing money right now, there are churches that are trustworthy that you can be sending direct aid to. And mm. I'm going to look this up, you know, while we're, while we're talking, just so I can give an example at some point during this episode. But then if you want to elaborate more on mutual aid and why that's yeah. necessary... So there's a lot of we're, we're having people coming to us as a church that are being that are falling through the cracks of the social the social service system in our society, um, particularly the nonprofit organizations that serve the needs of our community. Uh, and there are many because the needs are great. And so crisis assistance is usually the front door uh, and has become sort of the front door for need. And then if you, depending upon your need, crisis moves you on to one of the other many organizations in our city. But even crisis is now sending people directly to us as a church who are in need of housing and they're not eligible for whatever reason for the services that crisis provides or that one of the organ or other organizations, roof above, et cetera, in our city provide. And so we've been using our Sunshine Fund um, to... Um, really to house people mostly throughout the course of this past year and, and to provide direct aid to some. But you can also, that's sort of our mutual aid fund uh, for both internal members of our church community. We just had a, a member, some new members of our church who lost their home to a fire. Uh, and we've been able to support them out of, the, out of the Sunshine Fund. And we've gotten at least three people I know of, uh, well, two into homes and one kept in their home uh, through the Sunshine Fund this year. All these are folks falling through the cracks of our social service system. So, But mutual aid is direct money paid to the either the person or a, a person who's, a, who's directly uh, working with people who are impacted. Yeah. Um, and instead of going through a nonprofit organization with a 501c3, you go directly through a person. Yeah. Um, and sort of like Block Love Charlotte, I think they're a 501c3 now, but they started out as a direct mutual aid fund for tent city. Yeah. Right. Um, so on that point, the first Presbyterian church of Mayfield, Kentucky was completely damaged. And th the organization that is helping them in, in a bunch of churches is called the Presbyterian disaster assistance. And their website is PDA Dot org. So that's the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, and it's a it's a subset. It's a disaster relief subset of the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America. Mm. And so you can be donating directly to the PDA instead of trying to donate to your local church and having that church get it. It's going to take a while, and they need the money as soon as possible. Right. Yeah. So great. I hope you all can can do that if you have any extra to share with our neighbors in the Midwest. Um, my current event is um, more of a rant. You know, I am just mm. sick and tired of the student loan conversation. Whoa, okay. <laughs> Come on, man, bring it. I just feel like this country is falling apart. I'm seeing it locally. Mm. I'm seeing it statewide. Mm -hmm. The economic precarity that is running rampant in this country right now is, I mean, it's really unbelievable. The amount of people in crisis, the amount of people who are one paycheck away from being in crisis. Oh man. Millions and of we are still in a pandemic. And I mean, the thought of just restarting loans suddenly after people having like almost two years off from loans, I think it's going to be a disaster. I think, I think, I think it's going to be a disaster, Ben. I don't even know how else to describe. I just, none of my, none of my friends are starting to pay their loans. They're not doing it. They weren't paying it before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now I've been paying on it during the pandemic while there was no interest being charged. Yeah. I'm going to pay that down. But like these things, here's my issue. The system was predatory before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Nothing has been changed in the pandemic to keep it from being predatory. It was just paused. So we did not take these 20 months to revamp the system. We're just going to restart a predatory system. I don't understand. Mm. 
The fact that the fact that they have people whose loans were sixty thousand dollars, they've been paying on it for eight years and they owe a hundred thousand dollars. That's mm. a predatory system. Yeah, that's Why right. Why would you start a system that was already broken? You should have been <clears throat> fixing that system while we were in uh, whatever they were calling this suspension moratorium, whatever they were calling it. Right? You should have been working on this system to restart a system like this. Is I just my nerves <laughs> are bad. I'm not going to pay it. I just I've decided I'm not paying it. But we'll see. <laughs> well, there's a there's a debt strike that you can join if you're in the shoes of Mia and you wanna you wanna resist this uh, restarting of loans. And I would strongly recommend those who are interested in this topic uh, follow Astra Taylor on Twitter A S T R A T A Y L O. She's who's at Astra Disastra. Love that name, Astra Disastra on Twitter. Uh, Astra Taylor is leading a nationwide jubilee movement that I've been a part of and supporting, uh, not just so that all my own personal loans are forgiven, um, but that um, all people, all all Americans' loans are forgiven, all student loans are forgiven. Astra is fantastic. There's a video that sh that was just developed that she was a part of helping to develop for the Intercept that is about jubilee. Um, and this, the reason this one is so important is because she describes how all of our debts are someone else's assets, a source of profit and power for the 1%, which is why there's resistance to forgiving student loans. Because economically speaking, the forgiveness of student loan debt in America would lead to a major boost in the economy, a yes. massive, massive boost in economic. People would begin to buy life insurance. They would begin to buy that car that they've always needed to get to work. They would begin to pay for childcare. They would begin to do all the things that they've wanted to do Buy that, buy those things that they needed to do to take care of their family or to move to them. Even if they just bought television, that helps us all because our, we have a capitalist economy. So I don't care what they pay, spend the money on. If they buy a television, it's smart for us. So there's a logic at the heart of the capitalist system that then gets twisted when we start saying, that you know what people spend their money on, we, we're going to judge, and that we're going to judge people who go into debt. Well, when the, the economy is set up for people to go into debt, yeah, it's intended for debt, and people have already made more money on these debts, on my student loan debt, than than I've paid, than I'll ever, than I owed. They've already made more than I owe, just in interest alone. Yeah. So the idea that this was not a money making thing for the companies that have my loans is crazy. They've already made more than my loan probably twice in the years that I've been paying on it. So they're fine. They've gotten what they need out of me. So what do they, why do I have to keep paying just so that they can continue to fill their coffers and, you know, and some, some people say, well, you signed an agreement, you made a, you made a pledge. Um, yeah. I mean, there, that's true. That's at true. 18 at 18 or right. 19 or 21 or 25, whatever it was, you, you weren't, your right. age now. <laughs> and I also, and you also didn't, at those ages, do you really understand your lifelong earning potential? No. Um, do you really understand that you're going to go through for, for my lifetime? I don't know about you, Mia, but I went through a global recession and a pandemic while I'm holding these loans. Yeah. Not just one, not just a pandemic that's already almost two years old, but a recession with these yeah. loans that I've been carrying. So you know, no economic relief whatsoever related to those except the pausing or the forbearance, which just delays the inevitable pain of all this. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think here's the other thing. If you study this throughout history, I mean, th there have been many times throughout world history when leaders have forgiven debts in order to endear themselves to the people. In fact, uh, Michael Hudson, who is basically the expert on debt throughout throughout human history, an ec economist from Great Britain has written on how kings would like to like used to set up outside of a foreign, um, a foreign powers stronghold. And they would shout out to the people inside. If you turn on your leaders, we'll forgive all your debts. And that's how a lot of places were conquered that were fortified cities because the people would turn on their leaders and say, y'all have been saying you're going to take care of us for years, but you haven't. These folks are saying they're going to forgive our debts. You're done. Mm -hmm. And and so that was a technique that leaders have used to endear themselves to the people for generations. The idea that jubilees have never happened, you sometimes hear this by biblical scholars, it's crazy. 
the, the what happened what was written in the Hebrew Bible might not have exactly happened as it was written, but there have been dead jubilees all throughout world history. Yeah. And so it's not an uncommon practice. It is an important political idea that the Biden administration hopefully should be strongly considering. Yeah. Uh, we thought we were going to see something already by now. Yeah. Um, and they're, now, now they're talking about January 31st. I'm like. Oh, yeah. Really? That's when they're starting loans back. They're saying yeah. you got to start paying. I'm like, you could have at least forgiven the interest. Like, let's mm -hmm. start there. Like, I'm trying to help them out here. Like, OK, you can't forgive fifty thousand dollars. How about you forgive the interest? Right. If I think about the fact that I've paid down my principal, my principal is now ninety three thousand dollars, but I still have five thousand dollars of interest. You could have just helped me out and forgiven the interest. Yeah, right? just like, forgive the start interest. somewhere. Yeah, forgive us. Start somewhere, or just put. Make sure they never have interest from now on out. I mean, that's also another ethical problem throughout human history. Yeah. Us usury. Yeah. It's not just the debt; it's usury. The fact that's that you're right. charging interest on top of it. Yeah. The fact that people who are unaware of how to pay are paying for 10, 15 years and still not making a dent in their total payment because nobody taught them to pay on the principal instead of just the you know the bare minimum. I'm. I, you know, I right, just, you gotta, there's definitely needs to be financial education. I mean, at a younger age, I mean, this is, this is really important. And, and I, I, the problem though, is a lot of people will, we say financial education, we've got some members in our church who've been pushing this. What happens when you financially educate those young people and they make a calculated financial decision not to go to college, not to get married. You can't solve the economic situation of the country through education. What you can do though, is educate young people so that they can make better choices. The thing you're going to be surprised by is they're not going to make the same choices as their parents. Once they're educated, some of them are not going to go to college. Instead, they're going to get a trade or some, or go to, you know, business, some small business school, and then start working on the stock exchange. There are ways to make money and have zero degrees That's and make right. millions and millions of dollars and never have to worry about a student loan for your whole life. You know, um, so something is broken in the system when you can get a, you can have, you can be one of the most educated people in the entire society and yet be in debt because the job that you have is not valued enough by the society, even though it requires a great deal of education. Something's mm -hmm. broken in that s situation. Very uh, much. So we've got to get these things back in order. Um, and until they are, I think education is important, but it will only do so much because kids will be making, I know a lot of people who are not making decisions not to have children, you know? So if you start thinking about what does the society look like? What if you have a whole generation of people who decide not to have kids or just decide later or yeah. don't, or don't get married at all. I mean, that starts to change all sorts of things. Yeah. It, it's already happening. It's already happening. And, and even when I, the choice to the choice between choosing to pay my loan or put money into retirement, mm, 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 right? Mm, like, mm, mm. Like, you know, so I have to choose. They're like, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, if you're making, if you're asking me long-term benefit there, I'd put it in retirement because oh, you, might get, you might get your student loans forgiven. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, there's a small chance it might happen. So let me just go ahead and put this in the IRA. Right. The IRA is going to expand more, you yeah. know? So much Man. more you can do with that. Yeah, there's a lot here. One of the things, I think there's a quote just to finish up this section for us is, that keeps, I think all Americans need to keep this in the forefront. This is the first generation who will likely not, who we know now for the most part will not exceed their parents. Almost every other generation in American history had a better life than their parents had mm -hmm. because of economic advantage. This is the first generation that we know of in recorded American history that will have a worse situation financially than their parents had. And that is not the fault of the children. It is the fault of the system and how it's set up. If that's true, that needs to change our conversation around the generational divide, what it means to be, what, what economic stability means, jobs, basically everything that we care about. Um, and culture, what's right for this generation is definitely not, not the same as what was right for the previous generation. Uh, and a lot more empathy has to happen across the, um, uh, across the, you know, across the aisle there. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, basically all I want for Christmas <laughs> is my student loans to go away. Y'all can keep, you can keep the Hallmark. Bring us, 
Yes. Keep the Prince Charming farmer. I want my loans to go away. I, that's what I want. I want a Jubilee Christmas. Yes. A Jubilee Christmas movie is also what I want. I want a movie. That's, what, that's what we need, Ben. We need a Jubilee. We need a Jubilee movie. movie. We need it. What would that look like? Mm. So today, friends, we are talking about Christmas movies or what is a Christmas movie and what isn't a Christmas movie. Okay. Somebody <sighs> preached a sermon about this recently. I, I think so. I think somebody did. Um, <laughs> I, we well, already know how I feel about this, but this whole Christmas movie thing, you know, I, I've always been semi joking with you about watch, like watching these movies. I don't I actually. I know you're like, watching them 24 hours. I know you got it all. I do it not on. like the Hallmark. I don't like it, many of them. And the more I sit in front of the TV, the angrier I get because <laughs> the writing is so it's poor. bad. Very poor. That's the, my issue as an actor is like, can you at least make, make the movie good? Like, can you mm -hmm. use the same storyline? Like, make it good. Make the scenes good. The directing good. Pick some quality actors. No. Mm -mm. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah, good. it's always B-list actors and actresses. More like it, always looks like it, it always looks like it's produced by a Christian film company. Yeah. You know, which is, it's like somebody's basement and they've been Unwritten, praying, praying beforehand. I mean, like, yeah. like the 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 my okay, my pet peeve for the movie set in a small town mm -hmm. is that like, who is living there? Like, let's start there. Like, what are I'm I'm not trying to come for the small town folk. I'm really sorry, but like, I, I just I I have my doubts that the some of the people they're trying they're not they're trying to make these movies more diverse now and having some black people in them. I'm like, nobody is living in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, with Karen. Well, also like. You, you move to a small town, you move back home from to a small town from a big city and imagining like if I went back to my I come from a pretty small town. Kannapolis is not massive. Yeah. It's outside of Charlotte, you know, and I'm not that far away. Forty five minutes up the road. I go yeah. back to Kannapolis when I've been going back to Kannapolis over the course of my life. The city, the town is totally changed. It's not the same. The same people are not there. Everybody who could get out tried to get out. If they couldn't get out, they figured out what to do. Yeah. Right. And so like. You know, the thing that bugs me is you never have anybody come home and it's, they're really struggling with the rural poverty of their hometown now. No, it's, <laughs> it's not, these towns are there's devastated. no context. Yeah, there, there's no economic concept at all. There's <laughs> not there's not one Chick-fil-A or Starbucks in sight in the movies. And like all right. these towns have chain restaurants now. Like let's- Right, they're, they're, these are not like little quaint Vermont towns with a beautiful little main street that hasn't been totally destroyed by a shopping complex or a strip mall yeah. i mean like any small town you go into anywhere in america right now it's an arby's here and a hardy's there and yeah. you know maybe a chili's if you're lucky and applebee's you know i love that new country song about i might i'm gonna take you to applebee's uh for our date night i mean i that's for real that's like my hometown because that yeah. that's all we've got i mean that's like a nice night mm -hmm. right Two here in the city, we're like applebee's no but in the in the in Kannapolis, applebee's you know, yeah. I, I grew know. up with app two for 20. You get two for 20, yeah. $20. That's a good <laughs> deal for a date, right? Especially if you're not sure how the date's going to go. Right. <laughs> oh, so they're unrealistic, but we're talking about movies. So Ben, what do you think is a Christmas movie? Oh man. Well, I had, you know, I, I think there are obviously the standards. There's like, there's the home alone, the miracle on 34th street. Right. Uh, Winter Wonderland, um, A Wonderful Life. Oh, now that movie is a socialist movie. So if you want to watch a good black and white movie and get a decent, interesting economic analysis out of it, think about that movie. Go watch that and the bankers and the dynamic. Now, you won't you couldn't make a movie like that today. It would be called immediately be called socialist. And 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 all the churches would condemn it, but it's a beloved favorite. I used to watch it. My family used to watch that every year. Uh, George Bailey. Oh my God, that whole movie. That's a Christmas movie. Elf is a big new one that everybody watches every time this year. Um, what was the one we watched last year that was so good that came out last year? Jingle Jangle. Jingle Jangle was awesome. I love. I did that. enjoy that. I hope we can incorporate that. I like to watch the one, the Red, Red, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the one where he ends up on the island of misfit toys. You know, the one that's got the abominable snowman in it. Do you know this one? I don't know. I've uh, seen it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a classic. It's from back there. Yeah, 
I mean, there's there's some good ones out there. Jingle All the Way is a fun one with Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to get a toy for his kid. And Sin- Sinbad's in that. I love some Sinbad. Mm. Um, you know, th- so I think there's some standards. But I – so I have – I think there are a lot of Christmas movies that are not, first of all, that are, people are sleeping on, and okay. that are not that were not necessarily marketed as Christmas movies, but but need to be considered a part of the canon. Okay. So obviously, Die Hard is the one I preached about. That's an an obvious candidate for the canon. Okay. And I know you watched this, Mia, recently. So tell me what your experience of watching Die Hard for the first time is. Is oh. it first of all, is it a Christmas movie or is it not a Christmas movie? I, um, it can be a Christmas movie. Um, Uh I felt like Die Hard, I don't know. It just, it just sort of borderline unrealistic for me. And I'm just, I feel like I need to have super realistic movies right now or have complete magic. So like Jingle Jangle was like a complete, you could, it was fiction. She's doing Mm -hmm. magic things in the air, whatever, like her, you know, like I need, I need and like realism, realism, hard realism, or, or like we're Not Santa Claus of the town. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. So the uh, you know the whole like a lot of my struggles with action films. I'm like, okay, like he would have died like <laughs> five minutes ago. So um, <laughs> yeah. this bloody kiss, at the end, I'm like, what, what is happening <laughs> with his wife and the season's right. greetings tape? Yes, yeah, I mean, but yes, there yes. were there were moments that were funny. I was like, I, when I was first watching, I was like. Carl Winslow to the oh, rest. Oh yeah, Carl Winslow's in that movie. <laughs> he's the security to, guard, right? Yeah. No, he's the police officer that police comes officer. to. Um, and at first, I was concerned because I thought he was going to die because you know, like in movies, black people used to die first. They die early, yeah. So I thought he was going to die, and he didn't. So I was very excited that he stayed alive. The you see, it broke it broke broke some stereotypes there. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it was fun. I mean, I mean, I would watch it. I would yeah. watch it at Christmas with the right crowd, just and but like while people are talking in the background, it's not something I was like super glued to. I think the thing that so here's the appeal. Obviously, it's a Gen X like controversy, right? Mm-hmm. That there is this movie that is should be considered a Christmas movie that's not being considered one, and then finally 20th Century Fox gets in on it and they re- reproduce it as a Christmas movie. So, so it's got this whole and it's got this whole meta thing going on with that conversation with Argyle in the car. What's a Christmas song? So it's got all this fun stuff going on. I think the reason people want it to be in the canon is because they is is an alternative to the sentimentality. Yeah, I you know, know they want something that like you know grandpa and grand you know, grandsons and some folks can watch and be entertained and it yeah. not be a love story only. Yeah, you know, I guess there's some love in it. Um, you know, like. There's, it's got to have more to it than just the traditional like girl meets guy, girl goes sure. back to hometown, guy goes back to hometown, falls in love with old girl, you know. I I get that, and I appreciated that element of Home Alone and Home Alone Two. Oh, I do love that. About it's, it's it's a similar kind of action, but a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know, a little bit funnier. It's, it's funnier, it's, yeah. It's. I mean, Home Alone Two is my personal favorite, like of, of the two. I mean, no, I guess there's more, but they don't have Macaulay. Because well, you have the pigeon lady in Home Alone Two. I love yeah. her. I loved that storyline about how he befriends these older people in each of the movies, the grandpa and then this pigeon lady. Like, I liked that element. Yeah. Um. There's something about him out to get the bad guys. I appreciate that. Like, I mean, so I do like action. It's just, it was so a little he, bit more realistic. This is where Home Alone becomes double, like double meta for me. So Home Alone um, get, gets in my category of Christmas movie that the society should consider a Christmas movie, which for me, Die Hard's in that. But Die Hard is not in the actually gets the meaning of Christmas, Christmas movie. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's Christmas movies that should fall in the canon. They're Christmassy. And then there's the gets the meaning of Christmas, Christmas movie. And Home Alone falls in both categories for me because Home Alone, it's this idea that Kevin finds a way to reconnect with these marginalized, it's older folks in both movies, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But they're the other to him. They're the opposite. They're older. They're strange. They're, you know, creepy, weird. There's stories about them. They have birds. They have a shovel. Yeah. You know, what is it? And so, and finds a way to befriend them, and that friendship with them becomes part of his salvation. 
yeah in the story to me that's like okay you're a christmas movie and you you figured out the meaning of christmas in your movie i don't know many of that do that there are very few yeah i so yeah that's okay so so a lot of the movies you mentioned were very white um <laughs> yeah they were they're super white so i've been on this campaign the past couple of years of like trying to like identify and watch all the black ones now there's some trashy black ones too like not trashy but they're just mm. cheesy and you know, now that like certain companies, production companies are on to the fact that we also need like black ones, yeah. like own own network basically is like the black hallmark at Christmas time. I mean, yeah. the cheesiest black Christmas movies, <laughs> but Preacher's Wife oh, yes. is just the Preacher's ultimate Wife. because it's not quite a love story because she, she falls in love with Denzel Washington and they run off together. But there's something about Denzel's angel presence that awakens something both in her home and in the church. Yeah. And it's just very real to me because, you know, the church boiler goes out in the winter, which is something uh -oh. we've experienced before. That happened. That's happened at, at our church. Right. <laughs> it was the boiler yeah. last year. Yeah. So, I mean, it's realistic stuff. You know, they're arguing about the boiler. They're about to sell their property because gentrification. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like... Mm -hmm. Um, it gives a very real element and also takes you back to a time of like the golden, almost like the, the end of the golden era of black inner city churches. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. There was a time when like after the great migration, these cities like Chicago and Detroit became meccas for black Protestantism. And mm. they had these amazing churches that they built in Harlem and they built in Brooklyn and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you know, memberships dropping or tithes are dropping. And so you have this boiler situation and they can't get enough offering mm. to actually fix it. And you get to, and then you start to see like the foretelling of and I think Preacher's Wife is 97. The foretelling of all of these inner city churches moving to the suburbs mm. as companies buy them out. And yep. now they have these big campuses out in, you know, instead of being in Alexandria, Virginia, now they're in like Silver Springs, Maryland or like something else. Right. Yep. And yep. so for me, it's kind of doing something more than just Christmas love story, though. There is that element. It's dealing with some real stuff that has actually taken place since the movie came out. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I will. I will. I will grant it. I will grant it. Preacher's yeah. Wife is a Christmas movie. Isn't it also set at the time of Christmas? Well, you know, it's but, set yeah. during Christmas. So that, it gets major cred to me, just like Die Hard, that it is set. But I watch Preacher's Wife. Like I can watch that movie any all year round. It's because yeah. it's not. It's so much more in my mind than Christmas time. Uh, yeah. Just the the socioeconomic realities, and of course, like who can't watch Whitney yeah. Houston sing <laughs> over and over again? That album is. Yeah. I can watch Whitney Houston at any time, yes. at any any day of the week. I could watch her sing the national anthem at the Super Bowl any day of the week, any time. Yeah. Just yeah. put it on. I'll listen to it. Yeah. What a loss it has been to have that voice not in just continuing to sing. Oh. That's a massive loss. Gosh, it we is. Miss, I can't believe my daughter did not grow up listening to Whitney Houston. That is oh. just, what a shame. I thought I was going to be Whitney Houston. I mean, I just... <laughs> A lot of our church members think you are Whitney Houston. Oh, no, and not even close. I mean, she was just, like, iconic. She mm. was iconic. Her acting was good. There's a lot of people that don't cross over well. See, now, like, The Bodyguard is one of my favorites. I don't yes. think there's anything Christmassy about it, but I love that Kevin. And I like the relationship she and Kevin Costner had. It really does break down some stereotypes. It's complex. Yes. It's complex. So what about movies that you watch at Christmas that aren't Christmas movies? Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about all the different kinds of movies that were always released at Christmas. And so they feel like Christmas movies because we went to watch them. So it was like every year there was like a new toy story that came out at Christmas. So we're like going to see that or uh, with the kids. What's that? The Dalmatians. Often oh, the Dalmatians like movies. I, I remember when the, the real live ones the, um, with Glenn Close. Is it yeah. Glenn Close in it? But see, the original cartoon is 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 set during Christmas. So that's what, and the book is. So it really, that is a Christmas movie. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, it's winter time. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the Christmassy Christmas message of that movie is, but you know. I don't either. Save <laughs> puppies. Yeah, save puppies. Sure. <laughs> save the puppies, you know. 
Yes. There's not a lot of that in the Gospel of Luke, but you know, I'm sure there's something we could get out of that. Yeah. Um, That's a good got good one. I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah, I remember. I remember dressing up. My mom and I used to go see movies on Christmas Day or mm. the day after. And I remember when the the first the one the 101 Dalmatians the live version came out. My mom and I dressed up together in our 101 Dalmatians like sweatshirts. Ooh. They were like red and with you know do dog things on it. And we ha I had the matching fanny pack then. I was oh, okay, <laughs> Elaine. Way to go. Get me dressed up and ready to go. Well, how old were you? I was probably like seven. I don't know when the movie came out. I have to look it up. I was probably like seven I or eight. I have some respect young. for your mom doing that. I like that. <laughs> In 1996, I was seven years old when that <laughs> came out. Yep. That is amazing. And you know what I was Christmas day. I was just thinking of another movie series that comes out always at Christmas, and it's set in Christmas. Actually, every single one of them, I think, has Christmas in it, and that's Harry Potter. Ah, okay. In and every Harry Potter, they go through the Christmas break. Almost every Harry Potter has the Christmas break because it's using the school calendar in all the yeah. books. So the, each of the movies, based on the books, follow the school calendar of what Harry's doing at school. And so there's a Christmas break. And it snows and there's Christmas presents and he goes home for the holidays and there's always something weird that happens when he goes home. So I and they also all were released around Christmas, too. Yeah. So were the Lord of the Rings movies, but they're not set in there's no Christmas in Middle yeah. Earth. So. But I mean, that's a great one to play. I mean, J.K. Rowling has proven herself to be problematic these yes. days, but that's a great Harry Potter's a great life. You can just run those movies back to back when your family's over. Right. Right. Oh, you know. And they're fun and interesting, and yeah. there's different storylines, and um, yeah, that's and that's and it does feel very holidayish now when you put it on it. You get this kind of festive yeah. feeling about it. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to think of any other ones like that. Harry so, Potter probably like classic. So Rent, in my okay. opinion, is a Christmas movie because it's set during that time at the beginning. It's December twenty fourth. Um, whatever the year was, but mm -hmm. that's the opening line of the show um, when he's playing the guitar or whatever, and they're in their apartment, December twenty fourth, something, something, something. Um, yeah. and it goes through that holiday season, and then as the show progresses, it does come back around. I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I I did this show ten years ago, eleven years ago. If I remember it correctly, it comes back around to Christmas toward the end. Mm. Okay. After Angel dies. Yep. And That's some other right. things happen. But I mean, it starts at Christmas. There's a whole song that says Christmas bells are ring. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I okay. Say, I, I now that one also gets the double stamp category. Yeah. Christmas movie and understands the meaning of Christmas. I think. Yeah, it's it's very meta and it's right. talking about chosen family mm -hmm. in a different kind of way. And Which is total Joseph story, total Mary story. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. See, the thing I don't like are the Christmas movies that are also about the nativity. That They just haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, you know, they had that one movie about the called The Nativity that came out a couple years ago. Have you ever watched that? And they actually had a Middle Eastern Mary, thank God, for the first time. Uh, most of the actors looked Middle Eastern, at least. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's called The Nativity. I got to go. I don't know if I saw that. Uh, maybe I have. It's not ringing a bell. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's, 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 I think the cinematography is pretty good and the acting's not terrific. Um, yeah. But it's, now, it's interesting. Black Nativity, I think it's a decent thing. Oh, okay. okay. That's with Jennifer Hudson. And it's not about, it's not a movie that's about a nativity. It's, her father's a pastor of a church in Harlem and they're getting ready for Christmas nativity. And of course ah. it's sort of like a, what is it, the prodigal son? It's sort of like a prodigal son type movie. And then she comes back to the church because she's been singing and she has like a kid out of wedlock or something. I hope she sings all through the movie. She that, sings, oh, she sings okay. in the movie black nativity. You have to watch it with Lucy. You have I'm to yeah, we're going to, it's on our list now. That sounds um, amazing. But I mean, she sings during the church service and stuff like that. It's, it's an actual, it was a play before it became a film. Hmm. Um, and it's pretty popular around this time of year, but I think it's one of the better Christmas stories because it's not about somebody like, you know, moving home and finding their true soulmate or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what is it about the holiday? Like, so what is it about the holiday season that makes us feel like we need to go down that sentimental and not even just sentimental, but relational sentimental role, like where it's all about 
finding the right person. I mean, it, it really does set up to compound and intensify the loneliest season of the year, yeah. right? It's already winter. It's already a pandemic. It's already crazy lonely out there for folks who yeah. don't have that special person in their life, whatever the hell that means. And like now you're going to add on top of that all the pressure of these movies. You know, it's like I I just feel like do people even realize what they're doing? I'm sure they think, oh, we're going to this is going to be so nice and touch somebody out there. And that it's not going to touch somebody. It's going to make them feel like a sense of loss. It does. It's also not real. So, you know, I just can't. I mean, these people fall in love in like six days in these movies. <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you mean? You can't fall in love in six days? Come on. Like December 23rd and she gets home and all of a sudden by like the 27th, like she's in love with this person and moving home forever. I'm like, what? Yeah, no. That's not that, even realistic. That seems a little crazy. Yeah, not in this day and age. What, what, the, what are you talking about? They didn't have a conversation together about their student loan debt or that you know it's not serious. You know. <laughs> well, that's right. How and much then, debt are we? How are you bringing into this relationship? That's when we know we're having a conversation. There's also something about the way that they kill parents off in these movies that makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times somebody's coming home, somebody died, or you'll have these movies that start off with like a widow or a widower, and then she's looking for love or whatever because her husband was killed in the war or something. I mean, it's just like, and so I have a lot of friends who've lost parents, you know, at youngish ages, and they're like, it's really hard for us to watch these Christmas movies because- mm -hmm what we call in acting, the disruption of the status quo, that's like the beginning of the arc of a movie. The yeah. disruption of the status quo is always a parent dying. It's not like my grandmother died, which is like kind of normal for mm -hmm. your you know, mm -hmm. 85 year old grandmother to die. It's always like, like my mother randomly died in the car crash. Or, and so my friends who have lost parents or they struggle with these Hallmark movies as well. Yeah, so this is where I think we the there's also this other genre that we don't talk about a lot, which is the anti-Christmas Christmas movie like Bad Santa, right? Okay. Or the horror, Bad Santa's got Billy Bob Thornton in it. Or like the horror Christmas movie, right? Where Santa's like an ax murderer. Or mm -hmm. one of my favorite recently that I watched that I love is Office Christmas Party. Have you seen this yet? It's on it's on Hulu for free right now if you got Hulu. Okay. But uh, it's got Jason Bateman and uh, Jennifer Aniston and a whole bunch of other uh, really good people in it. Like, so it's well acted. Uh, but it's basically about like this epic office Christmas party that they have as they're worried that the Christmas, the part, the, 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 their branch is getting ready to go out of business. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is it like, it cuts through all the, the tropes, like Jason Bateman's going through a divorce in the movie. So he's vulnerable. You've got like this one guy at work who's been bragging to his friends that he has this girlfriend, but she's not real. He doesn't really have her a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So he hires she he hires a prostitute for the party, which goes awry. Um, you know, one employee is like she's in love with somebody she works with, and so she's having all these complicated emotions. You know, there's brothers and sisters in the office. It's it's really complicated, all the inner relationships, but it's the thing that's beautiful about it is it's the messiest Christmas movie that you'll ever, it's so messy. The mm -hmm. relationships are messy. The party is messy, mm -hmm. you know, and then it kind of comes all around at the end. But I, I watched it and I thought, this is what Christmas really feels like for a lot of people, right? <laughs> that really weird Christmas party for the at your office and um, like complicated, messed up relationships Somebody you know is going through a divorce. Somebody you know's kids aren't coming home. Somebody you know is struggling financially. Somebody lost a loved one recently. That's the Christmas party, not yeah. this like beautiful picture. And it's kind of like what we do to the nativity, yeah. right? Like we make the nativity into this beautiful picture of Mary is just so happy and just filled with pondering love. And, you know, Joseph is just calmly there, you know, playing his supporting role and, Baby's not crying, total Gnostic fallacy and heresy. You know, the animals aren't making a lot of noise, just enough to make it kind of the ambiance in the background. The straw is really soft. The haze perfect. The angels above hand, you know, the, the, the three magi come and they're not creepy or scary at all. No. They just, you know, just hanging out there, showing up randomly from across the Middle East. You know, I mean, it's just the shepherds, you know, coming out of the field smelling like sheep. They're not creepy at all. They're just kind of very reverent, you know, mm -hmm. happy to be there. We've polished this thing up 
so nice that we 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 missed what it is. This yeah. the messiest thing ever, right? It's in a barn. It's in a cave. It's in a stable. There's a horse trough for the for Jesus to lay in. It's like it's shepherds were disreputable. The Magi have nothing to do with the story. We've made it into this like polished thing, just like we want to do with every one holiday Christmas story. Right. We fell falls in love with him, and they're married, and moving back home by New Year's. You know. Yeah. Um, and I just think life is not like that. It's so much messier than that. And we, but we can. I think everybody knows if we just sit back, we don't need the perfect polished Christmas. We need to lean into the messiness of it and just appreciate the mess for what it is. I want a Christmas movie that's reversed that. I want a, 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 what you just described. I want one where she goes home and she's like, man, F this. I ain't coming back here. <laughs> this is racist that town. That will be an interesting <laughs> movie, right? And, and then the guy's like, okay, I'll come with you to New York. <laughs> <laughs> see, now, see now that was where we need to, well we need a couple of those we need the one where she just doesn't care right she's she like her job over the man because by the way <laughs> that's what people do let's not pretend that everybody's so sentimental that they're going right. to choose the person the spouse mm -hmm. the girlfriend the boyfriend over some yeah. amazing job in the city somewhere with their you know greenwich village apartment no that nobody's t turning that down to go back to rural Kansas. It ain't happening. You know? <laughs> like, unless they're like in like a 400 square foot, you know, walk up. Even right? still, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's doing, nobody's doing, <laughs> not to rural. They may go to another city. They're not going yeah. back to um, like, well, I'm not going to get political here, but they also just these, you know, I just can't. These movies don't make sense. They don't make sense. <laughs> They're not going to rural Alabama, right? You They're know, not that's, going that's back not there. Happening. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, no. There's problem. This is the thing. We, we, we need a couple of different versions of this. One, we need a version where the woman's just like, no, no, no I'm actually going back. You're a wonderful person, but I'm taking my job. And that's the end. End credits. Yeah. Right? And sing a song about, like, empowerment at that one. And then <laughs> the, the next one is, like, I come home and – the like the 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 more wealthy um if it's a male in this case and it's still we're still doing heteronormativity the yes. male uh chooses to go with the woman where they're going right yes. so it's not like you stay and work on my farm with me yeah who would want to do that but like i'm coming back with you to new york and i'll figure it out i'm just a guy in a cowboy hat and some boots but i can live in new york right like it's just like Figure it out. You're going to go up there, sell your business and go move with you. You fell in love. Like, why isn't that the choice that's being right. made? Right. And that's more real. Right. Uh, I mean, the big job in New York City is going to last probably longer than the small rural toughen it out family business. Right. Coffee shop, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're not making it with a coffee shop in rural you know, Arkansas, that ain't happening. There's already a Starbucks there. There's already a Starbucks. <laughs> right now and they're going to do it better. You're going <laughs> to not, you're not going to win. Um, and then, is here. It's here. And we need some of the ones like the one you found where it's like, we also have the LGBTQ love story. How about that on the Hallmark channel? There is one on Netflix now. I haven't finished okay. it, but two guys. So I won't spoil it, but he goes home to his small town. He brings his gay best friend roommate but his mom tries to set him up with some new guy in town. He's like, what is this new hot guy even doing here in this small town? So he does ask that question. He's like, what the hell? And they go on some dates. They like each other. But I won't tell you how it ends. But I will say that was a surprising. I was su pleasantly surprised. It was still kind of cheesy. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the writing. But I was pleasantly surprised at that one. <laughs> okay. Well, but that's a massive shift, right? Yeah. We're shifting from the heteronormativity of the Christmas story of going back home and um, yeah, I think that we need that one. Another fun one would be like, you know, you go home and you find out the the woman comes home looking for love or the guy, right? They come home and they're like coming out of a relationship and then there's this guy, but then they find out about what's going on in their hometown and they decide to stay and seek justice in their hometown, okay. you know, and like work for work for justice in their home. They found out that there's a, the mill closed. Everybody's working at Walmart and Amazon now. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to start instead of going back to New York, they're going to stay home and create a union for Amazon and Walmart workers. And they're going to be on the front line of the union shouting higher wages, fight for 15. Now that would surprise people. You start off with a traditional Hallmark movie 
And then right in the middle, they, they, they depart from the spouse option and they yeah. get involved in, you know, seeking the best, you know, what's best for the whole community. Right. You know, like, this, yeah. This is letting us know that we need to start a Myers Park Baptist production company. <laughs> I, that, we, we actually already started that and you started it. It was for worship. And now we've okay. transitioned yes, from yes. there to the equipment we have. Yeah. See, We're we going to call it. it Sacred Justice Productions. I like it. I like it. Yeah, it's going to be all kinds of upside down versions of everything. Upside yeah. down cartoons, yeah. you know. Um, it's like it's like the princess in a movie that's like, why am I so worried about this Prince Charming? Can I just get on with my life? This is really? ridiculous. You're like, yeah. oh my God. And then these movies have like sequels after sequel. There's like Merry Little. Have you watched Merry Little Christmas with Kelly Rowland? Oh, yes, yes. And then there's Merry Little Christmas Wedding. And this year, there's Merry Little Christmas Baby. I'm like, Ken, y'all, what is next? Merry Little Christmas Dog? Like, what are we yes. doing? Like, what's Merry Little Christmas House? I mean, Dog. Yeah. Oh, my God. The, <laughs> they lack never of, end. the lack of creativity really is draining. <laughs> I do think that there are some outside the box movies that are not Christmas movies that are coming out now that I would strongly recommend, though. I, I think this um, uh, Encanto written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, another Disney Pixar movie. I took Lucy to see that. It's all about family and our giftedness and those who have more gifts than others in a family and how that dynamic plays out. And it, the music is absolutely spectacular, celebrating uh, Colombian culture. And uh, I would strongly recommend people see that if you have young kids, go see Encanto. And obviously I told Mia before the podcast, I'm very excited. I went to see West Side Story, the Spielberg version. It is absolutely spectacular. No, no positive review you read is going to be able to capture how powerful it is when you go and watch it in person. It's absolutely stunning. Strongly recommend. And uh, I don't, um, it's not a Christmas movie, but it's a good movie. I mean, it's good. There are people, as we get, begin to close, there are people who are saying that um, West Side Story is behind on its money making already. You know, whoever, you know, people who like measure these things and they're saying, you know, we don't know what happened. You know, it's a hundred million dollar film and it's only recouped such and such so far. I'm like, well, it's a pandemic. Yeah. So that's one, um, people are still easing back into going out places. Right. Yes. Um, and then there was all this talk about how there was no major star in West Side Story. So the, the um, some what? of the. Other, well, they yeah, don't. Yeah, that's true. Not like somebody people would know. Yeah, so like when you had that terrible Chicago oh, with God. these actresses who can't even sing, who are starring in it, um, but they're big names. No, no shade. But Catherine Zeta Jones and what's the other one's name? Renee Zellweger. Oh my God! I mean, just but they were big names, so they sold the movie. And so West Side doesn't have that. But if you're a theater goer, you know Ariana already because she was the bullet in Hamilton. Like you mm, know her from mm -hmm. her other things. And but if you're not a theater person, you're like, oh, who are these people? So I hope people do really go see it and not get caught up in all that celebrity. Uh, Ariana, in my mind, is leading for best supporting actor right now. Yes. She's the winner. And I don't think anyone can touch her. So I'll just put it out there for folks. Not even close. And other people in that movie can sing. Mm -hmm. the, the woman who plays Maria can sing. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, to have Rita Moreno, who played in the original 61, back in this version singing somewhere, that will, if you, if you don't cry during that, you don't have a heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is so powerful. Uh, the one I'm really looking forward to as we finish our movie thing is this movie, Don't Look Up. Hmm. Have you seen this? I've it's, seen, is that a play? Was that a play? I don't know if it was a play first, but it's about climate change and it's oh. a comedy. It's like a macabre comedy. And they're saying that it's as powerful as Stanley Kubrick's work on um, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear disaster, kind of like forecasting what could happen. And uh, Jennifer Lawrence is in it, Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, oh. Oh, who's the, who's the amazing uh, Meryl, Meryl Streep's in it. She plays the president in it. Jonah Hill's in it. Mm. Um, and it's it's supposed to be really really funny, and also about basically about climate change. You know, like they they the, something's getting ready to come destroy the earth, and they you know nobody will listen to them. It's kind of like, kind of like now. <laughs> yeah, but I'm it looks interesting. Forward to that. Yeah. Okay. I have some some things on my list to see now that I've watched Die Hard. I can. <laughs> I still think though, if you really want to have a good day, you got to watch the one with uh, Samuel. Samuel L. Jackson. Right. 
That movie is great. The original is good, but the one with Samuel L. takes it up. And I mean, just think about any movie Samuel L. Jackson. I know he's great. He's great. Yeah. yeah, he's classic. Um, well, thank you all for indulging us for this Sacred Adventures series. Um, we hope that you all have a wonderful Christmas or yes. holiday season. And a happy new year and a happy Kwanzaa and all the other holidays that happen between now and New Year's. Yes. And we wish Ben a wonderful sabbatical begrudgingly. Oh, as thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Islands to meditate. Yes, I will be on some islands. I'll be in New York. I'll be all, I'll be I'll be everywhere but in the church and on Facebook. And you so don't look for me there. But Hi. I'll see you all rested and relaxed when I come back. Amen. All right. Take care. Happy New Year. Peace. Friends, that was our episode this week. As always, please email your questions and your suggestions to Reverend Mia McLean at mmccliin at myersparkbaptist.org. Until next time, take care. This is Sacred Justice. <laughs>